Um, we're going to keep uh, Michael Watson on now for um, a, a roundtable presentation um, on similar subjects and how Latrobe uh, Financial are approaching um, opportunities in this space. Um, again, we do try to keep these sessions as interactive as possible. So, um, you know, any questions or comments you have, feel free to, um, um, you know, pose them on the questions tab or on the Q&A tab. And, um, and, you know, Michael can address those either during the session or, um, or at the end. Um, thanks again, Sunil. Thanks again to all our panelists. Thanks, and um, Michael, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you all. I might just wait just a moment to allow anyone who wants to leave the call to leave. Um, what I will do is I'll just share my screen from my end just to allow uh, a bit of a slide deck that I have prepared for this. Um, we'll just check the technology works. There we go. So what I've got now in front of me is a, is a short, is a, is a slide deck that we run through with our investors from time to time to introduce Latrobe Financial, introduce the asset class, and really, I guess, engage and solicit questions that might be present through our audience. So I'll get straight into it. Uh, Latrobe Financial has been recognised as Australia's leading credit and wealth manager really since we began operations way back in 1952. Uh, that's, you know, there's, that's really what our investors know us for. Um, we are operating within the $2.5 trillion residential and commercial mortgage market here in Australia. And just for some context internationally, that, site, that market is 33% larger than the, than the entire Australian stock exchange. Um, so it gives us an extraordinarily broad and deep asset class to select opportunities from that generates, you know, a really strong and high quality investable universe. We have, gen we have genuine scale in the market. As you can see, we have over 400 employees um, based in our principal office here in Melbourne, in Sydney, in Hong Kong and Shanghai. And we can develop and execute on opportunities in real time. We have a range of investment products, traditional investment accounts, but, all, but also can build bespoke accounts for investors and investment groups that want to extract distinct flavor from the asset class in a way that suits them. The business itself has been, you know, having been around for 68 years, has been designed to weather all economic cycles. And we have some kind of fortress balance sheet, which I'm happy to take you through at length, possibly in, an, in another forum to keep this one as succinct as possible. Uh, and as you can see on the right hand side of screen, we have a, um, a very strong share register. So back in 2017, the business was 80% acquired by the Blackstone Group. Now, the Blackstone Group are, as you will all be aware, one of the world's largest alternative asset managers. Uh, they share a philosophy on the asset class that we do, um, very much aligning with us. They've made, they've made strategic acquisitions in businesses similar to the Trobe Financial across the globe. Uh, they see the tailwinds that we also see in the asset class. So from that perspective, uh, a really strong alignment there, which is fantastic. Just seeing if this clicker will work for me. Or indeed, if anything will work for me. Here we go. That one there. Thank you there. Thank you, Ted. So I'll speak quickly to the improving quality of our assets under management. <clears throat> the asset class that we are operating in is secured property credit. So loans to borrowers secured by mortgages over property here in Australia, primarily within the residential, commercial and, constru and construction space. Now the asset class here in Australia, possibly also similar to a global perspective is improving year on year. And on screen now, you can see the last five years worth of history from Latrobe as our assets under management have grown, but also in that time as the quality of the assets under management have grown. So at the top in the green, you can see the super prime loan percentage has increased markedly since June 2016 to now. And conversely, at the bottom in orange, you can see that the specialist loans, um, which are the more high touch loans that we may offer to our borrowers has decreased markedly. And overall, this has made a, a really strong improvement to the underlying quality of assets under management. We're seeing that 
across the board in our asset class, in our sector, um, in the non-bank space as borrowers, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, as lenders are re reacting to regulatory uh, requirements. Um, but certainly this is the Latrobe story here. On to slide nine. I've got it on this one now, I think, which is good. Now, as this slide populates itself, we can see what the asset class, if you harness the asset class of private debt um, in Australia, or as we call it, private credit, um, secured property credit, that orange line that just now that has just now populated itself is really what this what our strategy is looking to achieve and what the best attributes of the asset class can produce for investors. So the Latrobe Australian Credit Fund's 12-month term account was established in October 2002, which is on the left, on the far left-hand side of the screen there. And as you can see, that orange line, which is represented by across all the business cycles since, including the global financial crisis, the more recent volatility that we've seen in markets, that has continued to deliver um, a, a, a stable, repeatable yield month after month, year after year, against all the volatility in other asset classes. Now, I use the Latrobe example there because obviously being from Latrobe Financial ourselves, but of course, this is what the asset class can generate, that kind of consistency, which is really a premium for investors and what they you know, really seek in their portfolios. In terms of the asset quality, I won't touch on this for all that long, um, other than to say that the best elements of, and we talked about it in the last presentation, you know, what are the risks you need to look out for um, in the asset class of private debt? It comes down to structures, it comes down to the assets, and it comes down to the managers. So this is the assets. So as you can see across the board, we have a maximum loan to value ratio. So the, the, the value of the loan versus the value of the property of 75%. And that by having that hard capped maximum of 75% against residential property, and then um, risk adjusted downward scale into other sectors, that means that you at all time maintain a, a buffer of security there for the underlying investors, which is premium. But of course, what it also means is that your borrowers are aligned. Your borrowers have skin in the game in each transaction that you've entered into. So as you can see across the top line of the screen right now, you can see that the average loan to valuation ratios that we hold uh, across the board in the mid 60s, so 63.1, 63.9, et cetera. The four year term account being slightly higher with it being solely residential loans with the others being a mixture of residential and commercial um, security properties. And also location of the security asset is of course a, an, ex an extremely important factor. Uh, the vast majority, some 91% of our portfolio is in metropolitan locations avoiding the volatility that can be in more remote geographies. And we've got a mix of sectoral exposures, which I can go through in any detail at any length. Um, but of course, that's for another time, perhaps. Now, I talked about the quality of the borrowers a short time ago uh, and the improving quality of borrowers over time. So on the top left-hand side of the screen in front of you, you can see two lines, the blue line, which is the average credit score by independent third party credit agency Equifax. The blue line being Latrobe Financial's borrower cohort, the gray line being our peers in our art sector. So you can see that we firstly have outperformed our peer in terms our peers, in terms of the quality of the underlying borrower cohort. But what you can see is a, is a gradual improvement in that quality month on month, year on year. And that's that's a, that's a feature across the, across the entire Australian uh, property credit in, um, sector. One thing we did mention, and I'm going through this as quick, that nice and, nice and fast to get you to the key points uh, as quickly as possible. In the last presentation, we talked about forbearance. Now that's an absolutely critical part of private debt presently. Different jurisdictions will have different requirements and different restrictions will have different way, different approaches to forbearance. But broadly speaking, in the Australian context, we're governed by very structured, uh, legislated, responsible lending guidelines. 
where we have um, particular um, processes for borrowers who are in a formal hardship arrangement, where, for example, you, as, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, the borrowers can be offered an extension on their a, an extension on their repayments. It's not a it's not a forgiveness of the debt. It's not a um, it, it, they, they still have to maintain and commence repayments again. Um, but it does give them time to restore their position during the period of volatility or during that period of hardship, if they can demonstrate that um, once that period is passed, that they can return to, nor to normal footings. And pleasingly, that's what we're seeing here at Latrobe and across the market. So as you can see back in um, April, our hardships peaked at a little over 14%, which is, we say hardship, but forbearance levels for, uh, for want of generalized language. So our forbearance levels peaked at a little over 14% and have come back in a really organic way, but down to now just over 4%. And in fact, the print more, given this, this ends on the 30th of uh, September, it's now sub 4%, which is pleasing as well. It is likely that we'll see two to 3% of our portfolio move from hardship into arrears. They won't be able to come out of hardship um, and retain their, and restore their position. Uh, but we can work through that. We'll work through them each on a case by case basis. Again, and as was mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, we work to, in, you know, to try to achieve the best outcomes for our borrowers. I mentioned our competitors in the market that we are in presently. On screen now, you can see the present for hardship levels or forbearance levels in our accounts, our classic, our classic notice account, the 90-day account, the 12-month term account, and our select peer-to-peer -peer investment offering that we have against competitors in the market or the market more broadly. Um, Australia has a very well-established and large banking system. So the CBA, the NAB, WBC being Westpac and ANZ represent Australia's four big four banks, which you may be familiar with as a concept. And then next to that is a range of regional banks and smaller banks and what have you. Uh, and also some, some, some of our competitors. What we're pleased to see is that we have demonstrated an improved position, a position which is improved um, more swiftly than our competitors and the, and, and the wider banking market um, more broadly. This may be the fact that we have a more mature borrowing cohort than some of the bigger four banks who may, you know, be lending money to first homeowners and what have you, and those industries which are more affected by the COVID-19 shutdown. Um, but we, you know, it's, it's quite a good position to be in there with those lower hardship levels. Uh, and again, as was mentioned in the previous presentation, the various industries have been hit harder than others. So construction industry, you can see other services and what have you, all the way down, you can see the, the group hardship by borrower industry and the varying impacts that may have on accounts. Uh, what I might do now is just run through really quickly a brief economic update here in the Australian context, um, just to give you, uh, before wrapping it up. So we see, and we've been, we've long said at La Trobe since the COVID-19 hit, that there's likely to be three distinct stages of recovery or response to COVID-19. The first one being hibernation as economies and as communities locked down, as we've seen globally, as we've seen in Australia, as we've seen in, in Melbourne, where I am right now, where we're, we're in the late stage of a second wave of response of, of, of COVID-19. You have the hibernation state phase, the rebound phase as economies open, as communities re-engage, as latent demand is realised, as people return to work. And then the longer term restructure as economies, as communities react, respond um, and, and, and move forward in that COVID normal um, transition that we're all expecting. Uh, as to which direction it will be, wait to be seen of course, but that's if you like the Latrobe view the three, the three distinct phases of the coronavirus response. A lot of, a lot of <laughs> obviously there's quite a lot of statistics on this screen. I won't, I won't speak to them all, of course, but broadly speaking, 
the economic print continues to surprise on the upside. Original projections for GDP um, have been have have haven't been, you know we haven't met the worst aspects of that. So where people were expecting ten percent, we saw seven percent. Likewise for unemployment, where people were anticipating here in the Australian context double-digit unemployment, we've peaked around seven percent. So we're continually seeing data which is surprising on the upside, which is fantastic, uh, and just a demonstration a demonstration of the underlying resilience of the market. Uh, economists now comfortable, as the title says. I don't think any economist would ever give away or, or suggest that they are ever comfortable with anything, uh, but there you have it. Now, the Australian property market is something which gets a lot of airtime globally, I am aware of. Again, the property market here in Australia continues to be exceptionally resilient. Uh, you know, pundits for a long, long time have been betting against the Australian market that it's overvalued and what have you. Continues to it continues to demonstrate resilience across multiple cycles. Um, here in the Australian context, for year to date, you can see that in Sydney and in Melbourne, uh, for the quarter, I should say, the quarter just ended. Sydney fell one by one point six percent, and Melbourne fell by some three point three percent which is to be expected given, of course, Melbourne has had a second wave of COVID where Sydney did not. Uh, but still, they are still up 7.7% and 3.1% respectively for the year to date. So demonstrating a strong underlying resilience uh, in there. And there's certainly no signs of a disorderly house price reduction. So if you like, the housing bears have officially capitulated from this part of the market. And the trend is your friend, as they say, the improving trend is clear. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the month-on-month -month changes in national dwelling values in Australia. And the reason I raise this is, of course, in the private debt space, in any secured debt space, this forms the underlying security of the, security of the property, so of, of, the, of the debt, which gives you some look through into the potential um, you know, strengths or weaknesses of any given market. So obviously we are, it, obviously real estate is a market, real estate goes up and real estate goes down. Uh, we have, have had successive periods of negative movements month on month. However, it's negative by a reducing value. And as you can see, it's increasing now and it possibly will break even in the, in the months or quarters ahead. And importantly, it's not against completely fallen away sales volumes. So as you can see in September 20, the volumes of sales in the market have returned to see some strength, probably not, not as high as September the year before or, or the year before that, but, over, over, but, but overwhelmingly positive and in a strong direction, which is important there. I won't now, I'll, just, I'll whiz through this very quickly. I'll, in fact, I might go straight to, if you like, a bit of a summary here for you. A few little headwinds and tailwinds of the Australian market to give you a bit of a feel for where we are at. Interesting to see where the business turns on, uh, comes out of this lockdown stage and re-engages in that rebound stage as we mentioned before. So obviously watching the GDP print, watching a lot of high frequency data as well to see what that, to see what that will do. Um, again, we're seeing, as I mentioned, we're seeing data again uh, surprising on the upside repeatedly, but that is, of course, the biggest upside, the biggest headwind that we see will be businesses failing to invest and, and failing to get the economy moving again. Uh, population growth, and that's been an important one. The Australian economy um, has benefited from population growth for uh, quite some time now. We've been a quite a popular destination for migration globally for a number of years. Um, presently, we've seen net migration plummet, as you'd expect. Now, obviously, it's it's you know there's travel restrictions globally right now. How that how we come out of that will determine, in many ways, where what direction the economy goes in. Uh, it is forecasted to be low with, with low population growth for about two years before returning to a to to a previous trajectory that we have had. 
The third one, Victoria. Victoria is the state of which the capital city is Melbourne, where I sit right now. Um, Melbourne had a first wave of COVID back in April and May, uh, and unfortunately succumbed to a second wave of COVID through really through August, September and October. That has now been beaten, pleasing to say, we're at single digit figures um, for, number, for repeated days in a row, which is fantastic. Um, but what it does mean is that the Victorian economy represents a significant part of the overall national economy. So Victoria turning back on will affect how the economy transitions and how the economy moves forward. And therefore, that will also determine the underlying um, assets such as in the private debt space. On to tailwinds, the fiscal jets are on full thrust. So the, um, the government here in Australia, both federally and, and state-based governments are, they've opened their wallets, it's fair to say, they have put, they're leaning in and really um, giving as much support to the economy as they can. There's a whole range of stimulus packages across industry, business, consumers, um, in order just to keep the, keep the not only just to keep the, to keep the economy going, but to push it forward as well. So that is a demonstrated tailwind to our economy. Household finances define gravity. Interestingly enough, Australia, as I mentioned, the unemployment peaked at seven percent. Australia started 2020 in excellent shape. We hadn't had an we hadn't had a recession in you know two to, in nearly three decades. We had low unemployment. We had economic growth. We had a little bit of inflation, not much, but a little bit. Um, we had a really good starting point. And what then that has put us in tremendous stead to weather this, the, the storm of 2020 with COVID-19, of course. Um, strong savings, the Australian, borrow, the Australian consumer has a lot of cash at present. Broadly speaking, Australians have kept their jobs, as I mentioned, with unemployment still um, at 7%. So all in all, we've got some headwinds, we have some tailwinds. But if I can, and I'll just go to, I'll just go to summarize the key issues that we've seen there. The sector notes, you know, we have a, we, I just mentioned the fiscal policy. From a monetary perspective, the Reserve Bank of Australia, our central bank, is doing more now than they thought, than they forecast that they would. So they've been talking for quite some time about the zero bound rates that we have and basically telling the market that the rates that we have presently are the lowest that we will see. They're now expect, we're now expecting to see a further rate cut by the Reserve Bank, which we're anticipating for the, re, the November meeting to further push along from a monetary perspective, um, our sector. If I can, I'll, I'll go to the questions and answers form. If just to really summarise swiftly, you'll take that, thank you. To summarise really quickly, the private debt space in Australia is a very broad and deep asset class. It provides premium yield above fixed income and attractive for many investors across the board, across borders as well, I should say. There is increasing competition by new entrants and there is increasing demand for the asset class from investors who are attracted to that yield, to that low volatility. Now, I do have a couple of questions, so thank you. And I'm just looking at the time there. We're right on time, which is fantastic. So a, a question from Mohammed: Is there a big difference between Australian credit market and other market? We hear in the, in the news of the COVID impact in the Australian economy in general. What will be the implication on the debt repayment Great question. To start with, the Australian market is somewhat distinct. Um, it's got its own flavour, of course. Uh, in the previous presentation, we talked about the, the, the American market was referenced, for example, and the, and the UK market. Australia has a very structured lending market. We never had what you might call a, a huge, you know, you talk when you talk those, when you talk about the American market, you talk about loan devaluation ratios in excess of 100%. Never really a feature of the Australian market. You talk about ninja loans, loans to people with no income, no jobs, no assets. Never a feature of the Australian lending market. Um, so from that perspective, we are structurally very, very sound. 
um, and in good stead and tightening as well. I mentioned before, we again in the previous presentation, that we have seen significant and continuing reform by the regulators on Australian lenders to ensure that we are not just strong, but we're unquestionably strong. The Australian banks and by, and by when that regulation comes to your Australian banks, it filters down in most cases, in a lot of cases to Australian non-banks as well. So we have continuing reform and continuing um, um, prudential oversight through the market and regulator oversight onto the market. And that means that you know, we have strong bankruptcy rules. We have strong borrower, borrower protection, but we also have strong lender protection. The balance is about right there between lenders and borrowers to ensure that borrowers can you know, obtain credit um, and go about that with, with the comfort that they have protection. But also as a lender, we know that we can offer terms and provide finance to somebody and we know that we can enforce that mortgage if they don't perform under the terms of the, of the contract. So it's in a good place. That's probably the, the best way to summarise where it is. Um, I mentioned as well earlier with respect to the implication on debt repayment. You know, we talk about the forbearance. We, we, I showed the chart before with Latrobe's forbearance levels starting at 14%, then down at around the 4% level. Um, I, met, I demonstrated the a comparison to our competitors who also have shown that they are broadly speaking around the levels that Latrobe Financial is at. Um, you know, what drives repayments? Repayments are driven by, you know, the factors that affect them, unemployment. And that didn't spike, which is fantastic. Yes, it increased. It increased from a low base from 5% or around the 5% level um, up to the 7% level that it's at presently but it hasn't gone into that 10% level, 12% level that um, you know, the worst case scenario predictors were predicting. So that's a really strong um, tailwind on the Australian economy. And that really supports the lending industry, no end. But also the resilience of the property market as well. Um, you know, one thing that I didn't mention that is a factor in Australia is that, is that because of the the long um, time that, that Australia had without a recession, our borrowing cohort is in a very good position with significant aheads in their loans. So generally speaking, Australians are ahead in their mortgages. Now, I don't have the stat off the top of my head to give you, I'm afraid, but there's a strong aheads position, meaning that you know, there's excess servicing in the, in the industry, which is important as well. So I hope that gives a bit of an overview to that question, Mohavan, and I thank you for it. Uh, my ne the next question is from Marco, and it says, if I would like to diversify my investment in order to reduce risks, would you suggest to invest in commodities and bonds in Australia? Good question, Marco. Look, one thing I can't give, I'm afraid, is that kind of advice. Um, one other part of the Australian economy or the Australian um, financial sector is that we are extremely... Um, bound as to what we can and can't say in these sorts of environments. Uh, what I can say is the Australian economy is particularly resilient, that the Australian economy has shown resilience across multiple cycles. We didn't, for example, go into recession through the GFC. Uh, we have this year seen a slump in, in gross domestic product of some 7%, but it's anticipated to grow by some 3% in 2021. So we're seeing again resilience in the market, which in the Australian economy, which is fantastic. Um, from a commodities perspective, look, I mean, this is not advice, of course, but it stands to reason that if globally governments are going to be spending on infrastructure and the like, and that's going to be a phenomenon, phenomenon lasting several years, that commodities will follow. Um, of course, Australia has a strong mining sector. Um, you know, in various states in Australia from, and, and across a whole range of, of minerals and materials. So um, that, you know, it's reasonable to, to foresee that that would be boosted by, you know, a global, uh, a global increase in spending on infrastructure and the like. Uh, as to bonds in Australia, look, we, and, and again, this was a question raised in the previous um, session, which was, you know, if I can just take the question again for a moment, sorry, which was, um, 
for Quetiv. Just a moment, sorry. You know, which was what you what 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 you what do you look at when you're investing into? We look at the investment structure. Is it transparent? Is it clear? Does it make sense? Um, is there a is there an appropriate matching of assets and liabilities? That kind of thing. That's the sort of thing you, in the structure that you look at. Um, does the manager disclose the structure? Do they do they disclose significant um, you know portfolio metrics? Can you get a feel for the mechanics of it? Can you get a feel for the mathematics under it? Is it simple? But equally important is the asset. Now, um, you know, if you're investing into a single asset, how, how robust is it? And we talked about the various risks at play in the previous presentation. If you're investing into a portfolio of assets, be they bonds, be they equities, be they be it private debt, is it diversified? Is it uh, is it diversified by location? So one area having a good having a, uh, having a, a, a good time in the market or one area uh, experiencing difficulty won't impact each other as much. Is it diversified by type? You know, there's sort of the whole range as we've, as we've mentioned throughout, residential loans, commercial loans, construction loans, um, industrial loans, um, you know, construction loans, rural loans, the whole bit, there's a whole range of sectors that you can be investing into. Have you got diversification across multiple sectors to ensure that your fund and your underlying assets are robust, that they are that, that, that they are resilient as well. So you've got to look at the assets. Who and who are they, who are you lending to? Are you making a thorough credit decision on that underlying borrower? Um, we at Latrobe have a very old school way of looking at credit. Um, the, the old five C's of credit, which I understand is a global uh, trope that's rolled out, and the way that people look at assessing borrower credit. We take a very thorough deep dive into our borrowers um, circumstances to ensure that they are the right borrowers obtain the right loans for the right reasons. So that's important on the asset side as well. Uh, and of course, the manager themselves. If you're investing into a manager, do they have experience in that industry? Have they weathered multiple cycles? I think Ali mentioned in the last, in the last presentation, not wanting to invest into Goldman because that particular fund was their first exposure to that asset or to that sector. Um, and again, you'll, you'll see it across, across sectors all the time in any, in any sector globally, um, you know, new managers coming and going. So, you know, have you got a manager which has stood the test of time, multiple cycles, et cetera? So, you know, long answer um, to a short question. I apologize, Marco, but thank you for the question. Um, just, to, just to summarize, very resilient um, economy that we are in. Another question from Mohammed. Thank you again. Do you see an increase of foreign investment flow into Australia in the last five to ten years? And if so, from which region? Good question. Now, it's no secret uh, that the largest trading partner of Australia is China, uh, and particularly with our flow of funds through the um, through our minerals and through our mining sectors uh, has seen strong net flows and investment flows but also we have quite a diverse we have a quite a diverse um, range of countries that are investing into us be it your south koreas be it your uk's be it america etc there's quite a broad range uh, and again it's part of the resilience of australia and our economy for many many years has been our exposures to multiple uh, you know, has, has been our diversification sectors. You think mining, but you know, mining doesn't employ as many people as finance, for example. Um, education is a huge employer in Australia and a huge driver of GDP. Uh, tourism as well. Now, tourism is an area, obviously, which is suffering presently, um, but has for many, many years been a really strong driver of GDP in Australia. So, you know, we have a we have a very diverse economy with exposures at significant levels across many different sectors. Now, other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much all for uh, participating in this webinar tonight. I really do appreciate you all having taken the time uh, and I do appreciate as well the, those who asked questions throughout. 
very happy to take questions offline as well, if that is the case. Um, be it today, you know, be it tomorrow or in the weeks ahead. Uh, thank you, Alex, again, for hosting this session and um, good evening all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, for those participants that will be watching this back on demand, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Um, Absolutely. Could you well, share your uh, email address? Yeah, please do. My, my, my email address is mwatson, so my name being Michael Watson, so mwatson at latrobefinancial.com.au. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Michael, for your insights. Um, and thanks to all the participants uh, for, for, for joining today. Um, and um, yep, hope to see you next time. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much. Bye.